In my late 20s, I moved from Germany to a small town in Texas with a population of 17,000. The location was almost a two-hour drive to the nearest bigger city. As an avid lifelong animal lover, I got involved with the local humane society and animal shelter. There I learned to my horror that all wildlife in need of help was being euthanized because there was nobody who would take on the rescue missions. Fast forward a year and thanks to the gracious support of the Boy and Girl Scouts, I had a fully built rescue with enclosures, cages, and necessary facilities to obtain a wildlife rehabilitation permit from the state after a thorough inspection. I also received help and donations from the local population, such as blankets, animal food, and crates. During one of those visits, I met Richard. He was a typical redneck, living way out in the country, relying mainly on hunting and growing his own food. When in town, he would drop off any extra food that he had left for my animals. Over the next few years, he often came around to lend a helping hand, cutting down trees, repairing things, and providing supplies. He was a good friend, and he would talk for hours about personal issues. Richard was a rough guy, and although he bragged and exaggerated, he was always respectful and polite to me. He never hit on me in any way. He was just a good friend whom I knew I could call when I needed him and vice versa. Richard was a single father living with his parents who helped him raise his son, Rich, after the mother ran off chasing some drug habit. I met his son a few times and watched him grow up. When he was a teenager, they often came by after attending a gun show, shouldering rifles and bragging about their weapon collection. I felt very uncomfortable during those visits. You don't see many guns in Germany, and ending up in Texas, that was a huge part of my culture shock. I still haven't gotten used to it after living in this country for more than 30 years. One day, Richard came by to drop off some bones for the dogs, and we got talking. At that time, we knew each other for about five years. That was when this creep factor came into play. He had consumed some shrooms and was weirdly high. He proceeded to tell me how he liked to go into the city and pick up black prostitutes, despite being white. He got into a horrible racist rant that appalled me, but he was so into the zone that he just kept on talking, describing how he had taken two of them home on two different occasions to his trailer on his parents' property and then put them through terrible things, too terrible to repeat here. He then described how he took the life of each one, burned their bodies, and scattered the remains for the animals. After he left, I was just stunned. After running it by my husband, we decided it was just one of his made-up stories. There's no way that he did all that, and we convinced ourselves of that. We confronted him about it the next day when he was sober and he just laughed it off, confirming that he just made that up after watching a horror movie while on shrooms. Fast forward another five years, he met a woman and started a relationship. I met her, Tammy, a few times and took to her immediately. She was warm, outgoing, sweet and caring. They got married and we lost touch for another year. I assumed that they were in their honeymoon phase and were just content with each other. Then one day, he messaged me, telling me Tammy was diagnosed with stage 4 breast cancer and my heart broke for them. So I messaged her, asked her how she was doing and I was not prepared for what she told me next. Shortly after they got married, Richard showed his true colors. He began abusing her, controlling her, and eventually kept her confined to the trailer against her will. She didn't dare to call for help and tried to flee because he promised to end her if she did, and she didn't doubt it for a second. To top it all off, she said that Richard refused to pay for her chemo and literally forbade her to go through with it. She said that she decided to do it anyway and was to go into the clinic the next day. I promised her that I would talk to Richard at that time and see what the problem was. The following morning, Richard messaged me, stating that he just found his wife dead in bed. The cancer must have killed her, he said. There was no autopsy, and she was cremated within 48 hours, and that was that. I don't think I have to describe what was going through my mind. I didn't want to believe that he had a hand in his wife's death, but the red flags were undeniable yet I didn't see that there was anything I could have done. Call him on it and risk having him turn on me. Talk to the police about it. After she'd been cremated, contact her parents and tell her what I suspected. 
I didn't believe any of it would have made a difference, or if it would just make it worse, so I did nothing. All I knew was that I did not want to be around him anymore. Thankfully, he never tried to contact me after that, and I certainly didn't reach out to him either. Fast forward to December of 2021, a mutual friend messaged me with a link to a news article. Erith County Sheriff's Office investigate death of father and son killed in murder. A man in his 50s reportedly upset that his father had cut him off out of his will, shot and killed his own son on December 14th and then turned the gun on himself. Erith County Sheriff Matt Coates said deputies were called to the scene at about 10.30pm after the victim's grandfather discovered the bodies inside his home in Paldillo. Richard Calandrini Jr. had apparently been playing video games when his father walked into the room and shot him. Coates would not give an official statement about the murder, saying that the case is still under investigation. He said the killing had to do with money and the grandfather's will. Autopsies on both men are pending. My jaw dropped to my knees. It felt like I was in the wrong movie. I needed to find out more to be able to process this. So I contacted Richard's ex-wife, not the mother of his son, he was married once more between his son's mother and Tammy, and she didn't even know yet. We talked for hours about his abuse and his grandiose narcissistic personality, his murder stories, how he had almost killed her, and how she got out in the last minute. My entire world fell apart. How could I have been friends with such a person for over 20 years and not caught on to it? It shook my ability to trust my fellow human being to the core. We decided that she was going to contact the sheriff and let him know about the prostitutes he allegedly murdered and our suspicion about Tammy's passing. Richard had told her about three murders, one more than he told me. Unfortunately, the sheriff shrugged it all off. There were no missing persons reports that would fit those alleged crimes during that time. He said that right away without even looking it up. There's nothing that can be done or proven regarding his wife's death, and there's definitely not enough public interest to pursue it any further. And that was the end of it all. And I'm left with the big question of whether my friend of over 20 years was an actual serial killer. This happened seven and a half years ago. June 23rd, 2016, while I was cleaning out my house. I was renting a house for a year, and the year was almost up. I wasn't going to be living there in the next year, so it was time for me to start cleaning out and moving my stuff to the next place. The house that I had at the time was fairly small, but it was plenty of space for just me. I lived there by myself, and I had just finished cleaning out the room. Other than some basic furniture, I had moved on to clean the kitchen. There were quite a few cabinets, so many that I didn't use a good number of them, and I was looking through some of the ones that I didn't use to make sure that there was nothing I had in them. One of them I opened up and I saw something in the back corner. It looked like some type of shirt or rag. I grabbed it and saw that I didn't think it was mine, but then I moved it and it revealed a small white lever that I could barely see. The cabinet was in the corner sorted by the sink and halfway locked by the stove. I thought it was just another pipe, but it looked a little different to me. I got inside and had to crawl inside the cabinet, which was pretty large, and once I got inside, I saw that there was a small trap door to the side leading into the wall. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. You had to be completely inside in order to see the detail of it, and I decided to open the door which led to an extremely narrow hallway with a sort of crawl space. But when I got further inside, I was horrified. I saw that there was food, as well as several blankets, as if someone had been living inside of there. The good news, at least for me, is that whoever was in there was gone. I tried to make sense of it and figured out how long the person had been there, and how I just didn't know about it. I was gone from the house a lot with work and other stuff, I just didn't know how it was possible for someone to live in there without me knowing. I continued cleaning until it got pretty late and... The next day after work, I continued. I was still kind of in shock with finding a secret room in my house and decided to look at it once again. I opened the cabinet and went inside and pulled the lever open just like I had the previous day. 
but this time as I opened it, I saw a movement, and then I saw a person for a split second. They slammed the door back shut on me, and I immediately turned and ran all the way out of my house to my car and called the police. I was so scared that I started driving away as well. I opened my phone, told the police the whole situation, and they came to my house a short time later to find that whoever had been there was now gone. I was absolutely disgusted knowing that this random person had access to my house for who knows how long. It felt like some vivid nightmare that I needed to wake up from. When I opened my phone to call the police, it showed that the date was June 23, 2016. I still remember this date seven years later. It stayed with me like a scar. A scar that I don't know if I'll ever heal from. I was working in a small business in Iowa when a man came in for an interview. He was polite enough but didn't say much, but something just felt off. While my boss interviewed him, I stocked shelves, listening to the man answer our standard questions. What's your availability? Have you ever been arrested? Things like that. When he left, the manager asked me what I thought. There's something weird about him. I got really bad vibes. The boss kind of chuckled at me and said, well, we can't deny someone's employment because of bad vibes. I took out my phone and googled the guy's name. He had been arrested a few months prior for threatening to shoot up a gas station after being accused of theft. He lied and said that he had never been arrested. Is that a good enough reason not to hire someone? It was, and it may have saved our lives. I remember September 2018, a beautiful clear day. The calmness broke by the sound of police cars flying down the road. A student had been murdered in the middle of the day on a nearby golf course. She had passed a group of men who very shortly later found her things abandoned on the ground. Concerned, they called management and shortly after, she was found, stabbed to death, her body floating in a pond. Everyone was in shock. This was the second murder of a young student Iowa had had in just a few weeks. Was it a disgruntled fellow golfer? A jealous lover? No. The young woman had simply been at the wrong place at the wrong time. She did not know her killer and he did not know her. He was a homeless man who was in the woods by the golf course, saw an opportunity, and took it. He had a fantasy about violating and killing a woman. The next day, the story made headlines and plastered on the front was the killer's face. My stomach turned when I saw him. He looked so familiar. I didn't recognize the name, but then again, I've never been good with names, but I remember stories. I googled his name. The same story about a man being arrested for threatening to shoot up a gas station came up, and instantly I knew who he was. It was the same man I had convinced my boss not to hire. At the job, the majority of the shifts there was only one or two of us working. I would have been alone with this guy at so many points, so many slow hours with few customers, and so many blind spots, so many opportunities to be alone with him. It only took a few minutes for a murder to occur on a beautiful day on a golf course. So yes, trust your instincts. Let me tell you the story of my closest childhood friend. We were best buddies all throughout middle school and high school and ended up working together for a while and I was friends with his girlfriend of around five to six years. Then one day, she called me in a total panic. He packed all of her stuff, put it by their apartment door, and told her that she had to be gone by the end of the week. She had no idea where the breakup had come from. He hadn't been acting strange or anything prior to the sudden decision, and she wanted to know if he'd mentioned anything to me about it. I'd barely spoken to him in the days prior to his girlfriend calling me, and I figured that he was just busy with work or something, but I promised that I'd call him to try and find out what was going on. So I called my buddy, and I expected him to sound, I don't know, depressed or down in some way, but he sounded fine. I then asked him about the sudden breakup, and he just kind of sighed before talking me through his thought process. Long story short, 
He'd met a girl online and she wanted to come live with him and that was that. He knew his girl had a place to stay because she was still close with her parents who lived out in the suburbs, so he didn't feel guilty about giving her a few days to make arrangements. I know people break up and sometimes there's a lot at work behind the scenes that you don't see, but the whole thing struck me as super out of character so I was still concerned despite him trying to reassure me that he hadn't gone crazy. He was just in love. When I met his new girlfriend, I could understand what he saw in her. It wasn't that I personally found her attractive, she just is his type to a T. I mean, if you'd asked him to design his perfect girl, the end result would have been a lot like his new girlfriend. So as much as I thought the sudden breakup was still kind of heartless, I just tried to be happy for him and not ruin his new thing. But then very quickly it became obvious that their relationship was a volatile one. They fought like cats and dogs, but then made up again just as quickly. On multiple occasions, he told me that they were through and I'd be his shoulder to cry on after she threw him out of his own apartment. But then a few days after he'd return to end things, I'd give him a call and they'd be back together again. Things stayed that way for quite some time, with their relationship from hell teetering on the brink and then finally... I got a call from my buddy at like 2 in the morning and he sounded real bad. He wasn't crying or anything, he was just real quiet when he asked if we could talk. I told him sure, assuming that he meant by phone but he was outside in his car in the parking lot of my building. I asked if he wanted to come up and he said he couldn't, but then asked if I'd go meet him downstairs so we could talk in the parking lot. Right away I'm thinking something weird is going on because why meet on neutral territory when we could just be warm in my living room or comfortable in his car? But still, I tell him sure, then head downstairs to talk. When I get outside, he looks like he's been crying, so I assume something had happened with his girlfriend. I kind of hoping that she's finally just up and left him, but I also knew to just let him tell me at his own speed. But then, when he finally found the words to tell me what he'd done, my jaw almost hit the floor. They'd had an argument, one that had gotten pretty heated before getting physical. She'd hit him, she spat on him, she scratched him, threw stuff at him, but the whole time he's just shoving her away trying to keep her off of him while yelling back and forth about whatever they were arguing about. And suddenly, she walks off and he thinks it over, but then she walks back moments later with a knife in her hand. She got one good swipe at him and he showed me the wound too, this shallow slash on his stomach that he'd covered up with a few of those sticky bandages. But then he told me what happened next, or rather, he didn't tell me what happened because he claimed he couldn't remember. He just knew that when he'd finally came round again, as he put it, he realized what was happening. His girlfriend was dead. I then figured out why he didn't want me to get in his car and it was the same reason he didn't want me to talk in my apartment. His girlfriend's body was in the trunk. He didn't know what else to do so he bundled it up into his trunk and decided to hand himself in at the nearest law enforcement precinct. The reason he'd stopped by was because he wanted to say goodbye. I had no idea what else to do. I tried to hug him without hurting his stomach wound and I told him that I'd always be there for him and then wished him good luck. I know that's messed up. I know he just killed a girl but I honestly just couldn't bring myself to do anything else. I kind of wanted to just walk back inside because hearing that he'd just taken a life literally made me feel like I was about to have a panic attack. But in the end, I guess I fell back into habit and just tried to be his buddy one last time. He got life and I've visited him a few times, but every time there seems to be less and less of the guy I used to know, and more and more of this other guy, who looks at me like there's a part of him that hates me. Maybe we're just not the same people anymore. Maybe our friendship has just played itself out like so many are prone to do. But sometimes, I imagine how things could have been. Couples dinners with our wives, taking our kids to peewee football together. But instead... He's rotting in a prison cell, getting high, and just waiting around to die. A 
I'm a father of two. My daughter is seven this April, but I had my son when I was only 17. It was an accidental pregnancy, and he knows that, but he also knows that when push came to shove, me and his mom decided to make it a proper go of it, and we were married for nine and a half years before finally calling it a day. But then, even after the divorce, me and his mom worked our butts off for him, stayed on good terms, and I'm proud of the young man that we raised together. Becoming a parent for the first time, especially at such a young age, it came with a whole host of thoughts and feelings. But the one that pertains to this story is fear. The prospect of being a 17-year-old dad was just beyond terrifying, but even when I accepted it and took to relishing the responsibility, that sense of dread never went away. There was always something to worry about, always something to be afraid of be it disease, financial difficulty, or violent misfortune. I worried about what kind of dad I was going to be, what kind of son I was going to raise, and about all the trials that we'd face along the way. My anxiety was just non-stop for a long, long time, until one day, I kind of fell into the groove of it. One of the brutal truths about being a parent is that your kids are going to get hurt, and there's nothing you can do about it. They're going to fall off of swings, scrape their knees, burn themselves, cut themselves, bash their heads on things, and they do so in some astonishingly creative ways sometimes. But then, you also can't coddle or try and shield them from things like that, because keeping them locked away in some gilded cage can be just as damaging in the long term, and so you learn to mitigate. You keep bleach out of reach from their little hands, you buy them a helmet for when they're learning to ride a bike, you impose curfews, you buy them phones, you set boundaries and all that kind of stuff. Then what I found is that you mitigate correctly when they finally do run into the house screaming and crying after fracturing their wrist or something, you don't feel as guilty. You did your job as a parent, you did everything you could outside of wrapping them up in bubble wrap, so all you have to do is then put on that colorful dinosaur plaster, drive them to the hospital, and give them a cuddle and say, they're there. But it wasn't always like that. Sometimes, something would happen that reminded me of what a frightening and dangerous place the world truly is. During the summer holidays of 2002, my son stayed with me for three weeks in June and July while his mom went on holiday to Greece with her mates. We lived just around the corner from one another, which was really handy because it meant that my son could ride his bike over to his mate's houses. He was 11 and just about to start secondary school, so he was at an age where me and his mom were allowing him more and more responsibility. So he could pop around to his friends in the day as long as he was back in time for tea, which tended to be around half four to five o'clock. So one day, my son asked if he could ride his bike around to his pal's house to play PlayStation, and I gave him permission, then got cracking with this DIY project that I had planned, which I knew was going to take a couple of hours and was probably a bit too dangerous to have my kid over when I was doing it. He went out at about noon, with his usual curfew at 5pm in place, but he returned unusually early just before 3. I was in the back room, up on a ladder, so all I heard was our back door slamming before my son ran upstairs to his room. Call it a parent's intuition, but I knew something was wrong. My son would usually never just run up to his room like that without saying hello, and I'd never known him to return home from his friends early unless something was the matter. I called out to him, asking if he was okay, but there was no reply. So I got down off my ladder and walked upstairs to see what was bothering him. When I walked into his room, my son was sitting in a really odd position, jammed into the little space between his bed and his window, almost like he was trying to hide from something. Like I said, I knew something was wrong, but I also knew it was best to approach the subject gently rather than directly. I started off with a bit of small talk, asking how his day is and that kind of thing. His replies were very just quick fine, good, okay, and then I asked him what exactly he'd been up to that afternoon. My son didn't say anything at first, he just sat there, facing away from me, and then he started to cry. I just sort of rushed forward, pulling his bed away so I could get to him, and then I picked him up and hugged him as he cried. I knew that there was no getting him to talk while he was in such a state, so I focused on calming him down, telling him that it was going to be okay, and let him cry it out before he was ready to tell me what had happened. 
I asked him if he had a falling out with one of his friends, and he shook his head. I then asked if one of his friends had hurt him in some way, or if their parent had been shouting at one another and that's why he'd come home early. But again, my son shook his head as he wiped away his tears. I think I must have asked him half a dozen different things before I started to get genuinely curious. He still had all his fingers, toes, and teeth, so how bad could things actually be? But then, my son told me what had happened, and as he spoke, I felt the color drain from my face. Since that day had been lovely and sunny, his friend's mom had told them to take their bikes out for a spin instead of staying cooped up in a dark bedroom playing PlayStation. All good so far, but then he carries on. They rode their bikes down to a spot near this old fishing lake, not too far from where we lived. It's a big place too, with woods on either side of it, making it the perfect place for two young lads to go off on some summer holiday adventure. And apparently, that's exactly what they were doing too, just exploring the woods on one side of the lake and skimming stones and that kind of thing. And suddenly, a strange man came walking through the trees before approaching them. My son said that, at first, he and his friend just carried on playing, which, unsurprisingly, involved them being excessively loud. The man seemed to just walk on by until they got rowdy again, at which point he turned and loudly shushed them. My son said he and his friend were quiet, and then the man walked towards them, explaining that they had to be quiet because they were in his favorite fishing spot, and they were scaring away the fish by being noisy. My son didn't see any fishing rod in the man's hand, nor did he see any camping stools or tackle boxes around, but he'd also been raised to respect his elders, so he took the guy's word for it and he apologized for being noisy. He thought the man would just leave them alone, but he didn't. Instead, he asked if either of their parents were around. My son was honest and he told the man no, then started to explain that he and his friend had ridden all the way down from our estate on their bikes, but then the man started to shush him. He then insisted that they all talk in whispers, lest they scare away the fish, and then he started asking the boys some other questions. I've come to the conclusion that I can't actually type out any of the things my son said. I simply can't bring myself to do it. But let's just say that the things that the stranger asked my boy were as explicit and inappropriate as they were perverted. I've already touched on it, but as he spoke, I literally felt the color draining from my face. I've never felt anything quite like it in my life, and at the same time, I had to act as calm as possible for the sake of my son. I asked him what happened, and he told me that he and his friend had become very uncomfortable and had walked off towards their bikes after telling the man that they wanted to go home. He tried to get them to stay, offering them all sorts of things, but they knew what he was asking them was wrong, and it scared them. They got on their bikes and started to ride off. Then, the thing that really scared my son is that the man had run after them as they took off in one final attempt to, I don't know, snatch them or worse. My son said that he and his friend screamed as they pedaled fast as their legs could carry them and thankfully, the man was too out of shape to catch up with them. But that didn't mean that it didn't scare them half to death and they each rode straight home after making it back to the main road. I was properly dumbstruck for a while, I just didn't know what to say. But then one burning question popped into my head and then out of my mouth before it even had a chance to really register. I asked him if he had seen the man anywhere before, and he said, yes. I hadn't really considered the implications of either a yes or no answer, I just blurted out the question. But when my son said yes, that he had indeed seen the person before, I felt this wave of nervous nausea wash over me. I then asked where he'd seen this man before, but he said that he couldn't remember, only that his face seemed familiar and he thought that he recognized the jacket the man was wearing. When my son told me that this all happened less than an hour before, I asked him to follow me downstairs into my car. He was reluctant and I'm not proud of it, but I snapped at him, and he was on the verge of tears again by the time we were driving down towards the area where the fishing lake was. We drove around for about an hour, and every few minutes I was asking my son, Do you see him? Do you see him? But it was no good. My son didn't spot the man who'd approached him by the lake, and I called the police the second we got back home. 
In hindsight, that's probably what I should have done to start with, and I suppose I wasn't thinking properly when I drove out with my son to try and hunt him down. But I think at the time, my biggest fear was that the police weren't going to take it seriously, and that the best course of action would be to tackle the guy before he got another opportunity to hurt a child. So I called them, got told that a police officer would pop around to have a chat with me and my son, and then we waited three hours for her to turn up to talk to us. After she'd asked us a load of questions, I mentioned that my son thought that he had seen the guy before, and after my son confirmed it, the officer made a note of it and then told me that she'd be in touch. She was, a few days later, saying that she and her colleagues were almost certain that the man had driven into the area from somewhere else. I asked how they knew this, and she said that after consulting with colleagues from another regional police force, they'd shared several reports regarding a man matching almost the exact description my son had given me. And that was a little bit of reassurance, but not much. I mean, thank God that he wasn't a local fella, but if my son really did recognize him, and he didn't just have one of those faces, then there was a chance that he'd be prowling the area for months. Unfortunately, there were no arrests or further developments, but the incident did spark something of a stranger danger frenzy among the locals where we lived. But then, it wasn't exactly unwarranted hysteria. Someone had tried to do something unspeakable to my own flesh and blood, and I'm not sure if words could ever describe how furious and fearful that made me in equal measure. All the kids at my son's primary school got a talk from a policeman who came in to chat with them about stranger danger, and he and his secondary school classmates got a similar talk that September. There were no other incidents like the one my son and his friend went through, and I'd like to think that it was down to the atmosphere around town afterwards. If he was an area man, then he'd most certainly have heard everyone talking about it, even if he did live in the next town over. It was big news, definitely regionally if not nationally, so I think maybe that scared the bloke off and kept him lying low, at least for a while and hopefully forever. Of all the frightening things I thought that I'd face as a parent, I did actually consider having my kid almost snatched or touched to be one of the worst possibilities. So to have it actually happen, it was as surreal as it was terrifying. I've never faced anything so mentally taxing in all my life and I well and truly hope that I never have to go through anything similar ever again. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, and I mean it when I say that I pray it doesn't happen to you, too. My name is Anastasia, and a few days ago, something happened that makes me sick. We moved to an east coast town about a year ago to be closer to family, so close in fact that my aunt, her wife, and my cousins are only a 10 minute walk from my house. Granted, we are very spaced out and borderline rural despite living about 15 minutes from the outskirts of a big city. I was walking my two little dachshunds back home from my aunt's house. My mom hates it when I'm alone the majority of the day, so I spend time at their house and I was genuinely enjoying my time. It was cold but quiet and oddly beautiful. I got home, fed my pups and two birds, and facetimed a friend. I was talking with them and doing chores and was admittedly being loud and giggly when taking out the trash of the cans on the side of my house. I get back inside and lay down in bed still chatting when my bird starts calling at someone. Now, anyone who has owned a parrot knows that they have distinct noises for certain moments. She has been in my family for 76 years and with me my whole life, so I knew the sound was alarm or intrigue. I brushed it off as her seeing herself in the window reflection and go back to talking to my friend. I get up to get water and my back is to the sliding glass door, thankfully locked, and my friend has the wind knocked out of him. I'm confused and I think he's hurt and he tells me, Go back to your room, now. I scoff, but... Then I see it in my camera view. There is a man with his face and hands pressed up against the glass door. He's a middle-aged white guy in a gray pullover and dark pants and a grin on his face. My friend, ever the best in panic situations, tells me, don't look at him, just go to your room. I was shaking so hard. I'm blubbering and decide to lock me and my dogs in my closet. My parrot is still going crazy. 
English isn't my first language, and it's bad when I'm shocked, so I revert back to my native language, which he doesn't know. Luckily, my friend knows to take charge, and he tells me that he'll be over in ten, and he calls the police. I'm thinking that I can run to my mom's room and find the gun, so if the guy comes into the house, I can blow a quarter-sized hole in his chest. I'm debating getting up when I hear tapping on my window. It's slow and intentionally creepy, and my stupid dog starts barking. I'm ready to accept my death at that point. I'm a teenage girl, home alone, and I'm about to die. Wait, my aunt should be about to leave for work right now, and I shoot her a quick text. Emmy, there is a man at my window, please help me. The tapping has stopped, and I think it's over when I realize something that makes my heart drop into my stomach. I left the front door unlocked when I took out the trash. This keeps getting worse, and I beg my friend to hurry. The tapping thankfully returns to my window, and I can only close my eyes and hope that someone gets here fast. It feels like an eternity, crying to another teen who's breaking multiple traffic laws, never before have I ever been grateful to hear another man's voice yelling outside my house at 1am. It was my godsent neighbor. Apparently his pregnant wife was having bad nausea and went outside on the deck, and where it's situated you can see my whole backyard. She got a bad feeling after seeing the unfamiliar man approach the door and woke her husband to check it out. And I thank God every day for her because I think she saved my life. I let my neighbors into my house and my aunt comes about four minutes later, packing major heat, and my friend not long after. I go from home alone to an impromptu house party of concerned people. The police come like ten minutes later, like they didn't just take thirty minutes to arrive to the scene. What the freak, is this normal? On the brighter side, my bird wasn't too alerted by this encounter and went back to eating not five minutes later, and my dogs were just happy to see people. My friend has been staying the nights with me since, and I'm finding it hard to be home alone despite the fact that an arrest was made. And I'm so thankful that my neighbor had such good instincts and that my aunt and friend were so quick on their feet because this could have turned out a lot worse. Well, I've recently found this subreddit and decide that I'd share a story with you all. This happened back in 2019 to 2021 and it still sticks with me today. I'll be using fake names for myself and the man I'm talking about, Mary for myself and Dennis for him. When I was 13, I met someone on Discord. He was funny, smart, and exactly my type. He was also 16. I don't know my logic with that being okay at 13, but I was stupid and naive and we became close friends. After about three months of knowing him, I told him that I had feelings for him. We then ended up dating. We lived across country from each other, and we were basically just friends, but whatever. So as we were dating, he starts basically grooming me. As a kid, who was always on the internet and was exposed to kick also, I was used to this behavior and thought it was fine. He had sent me some pretty inappropriate photos, gross messages, and pretty much I worshipped him. I wasn't allowed to talk to people on Discord without him being there and strange stuff like that. He told me that he would take his own life if I ever left and how he was always on drugs because he was so sad. He also was incredibly racist and thought Nazi jokes were okay. I'm so mad at myself for not realizing that it wasn't okay back then. He ends up cheating on me with his ex and tossed me out of the door. He doesn't talk to me anymore and says that we shouldn't talk anymore because we aren't together. And here's where it gets really bad. Note this happened over five years ago and I have a pretty spotty memory of this time. New accounts pop up in the server that we met on. It was a server of mutual friends and start saying horrible things about me. Mary's a fat whale, Mary's some pretty bad words and more things of the sort. The accounts have names like Jerry Touches Kids or Big Fat Whale, etc. And I had gotten in trouble with the server owner because it was my fault that people were saying these things. Like I had told them to spam things about me or something. The accounts also start messaging me to end myself, die, how I'm a whale, and all sorts of terrible other things. I ended up blocking every account and move on with my life. Great, it was over with. Or so I thought it was. 
Fast forward a year to late summer of 2019 and everything starts up again. The messages, him telling people lies and rumors, and direct threats. I was sent unsolicited images and death threats and slurs and that I should take my own life because no one cares. And at that time I had undiagnosed depression and anxiety and almost did actually do these things. I went to therapy and tried to get over it. In 2020, right when the quarantine happened, I got a boyfriend and I was super happy and came back out of my shell. He and I would play games on Discord together and I joined more servers. Around two months later, I got another message. Someone had messaged me named Lily, I believe. It was a normal profile and we were in a server together so I didn't think anything of it. She then had messaged me how I was and I had never talked to her before so I was confused. She said that we had a long conversation about mental health the day before so she wanted to make sure that I was alright. I asked who she was and what she was talking about and she said something like, Oh, you told me about this. You said that you take medicine for schizophrenia and must have missed a dose. Are you off your meds? I was extremely confused and scared because I had never talked to this person and certainly didn't have schizophrenia. After about 10 minutes of this charade, I realized that it was Dennis. I blocked the account and didn't accept any new friend requests. The next day, I got hundreds of messages with the same contents that I had previously mentioned. The threats, the illicit images. I was so terrified that I asked my boyfriend for help, and he told me to make a new account and not friend any of the other mutual friends so he couldn't find me. I did, which costed an affiliated Twitch account that I'd spent years building. I changed all my accounts, deleted most, and made new ones. The messages found me again. I have no idea how these new accounts weren't tied to me. I got fed up and had asked a mutual friend that I thought that I could trust some personal information about Dennis to go to the police and get a possible restraining order or something. I didn't totally know how the police handled these issues. Months go by and nothing until the fall of 2021 in which Dennis messages me again calling me terrible names and how he'll always find me, how I'm so fat and dumb and no one loves me. I isolated myself and deleted more accounts. I never was able to go to the police because I had no information, like his full name or address. It's been two years and every day I worry if he lives near me, if he knows where I live or go to school. I recently found out that he had a website and made YouTube videos, He's made YouTube videos referencing me in 2022. His copyright claim is something like Marry the Fat Whale Inc. I can't find it anymore so I put the closest to what I remembered. And this was hell. I'm still worried every day that he'll find me and I believe that he has a Reddit account and could potentially find this. I hope we don't meet again Dennis and I wish you the worst. To provide some context, I used to work as a 911 dispatcher for a small city. Our responsibilities included dispatching for all law enforcement, fire, and emergency medical services throughout the entire county. Within this county, there were multiple law enforcement agencies. I had been in this position for about three months when I met him. We'll call him Jake. Jake had just recently transferred from a larger department in California and had ended up at our department seemingly by chance. It didn't make much sense why he left California in the first place, but he always insisted it was time for him to move to a smaller and less dangerous department. Jake and I quickly became close and would chat almost every day after my shift ended. Within a few months, it became apparent that we liked each other, and our flirting evolved into something more serious. Fast forward a few months later, and it turns out that he was engaging in inappropriate behavior with photos and videos of me while actively on duty. This, along with a few other things that he had concealed while on duty, led to the revocation of his license and his departure. During the process of his termination, his sergeant suggested that I obtain a protective order against him because he had previously made threatening statements towards me such as, you better be telling the truth, I'll find out on Tuesday if you're lying to me, etc. I began filling out the paperwork and was informed that I had a temporary protective order against him in the meantime although I'm not certain if it was ever finalized. About two weeks after his termination, he called me to catch up. The entire call seemed like a conversation between old friends. He asked about my job, 
whether I had a boyfriend, and gradually shifted to more personal questions such as when my shift ended and what kind of car I drove. Being 18 and naive, I treated him as I always had and answered his questions. Afterwards, I contacted his former department, as his sergeant had advised me to do so if he ever contacted me again. However, they quickly turned me away and didn't want to be involved, and with that, I decided to block Jake. Approximately a month later, I received a call from a new member, and it was Jake again. Once more, he wanted to meet and catch up, but this time he casually mentioned wanting to buy a new house in my neighborhood, even though I had never told him where I lived, let alone the specific neighborhood. During this call, he became progressively more aggressive, making statements like, if I knew I was going to get fired, I should have just taken advantage of you. He half-heartedly joked about getting a hotel room just for me, and then the call ended. A few days later, he FaceTimed me, and again, he initially seemed like he simply wanted to catch up because he was sick. Midway through our seemingly normal conversation, he made it apparent that he had been engaging in inappropriate behavior during our call. It's important to note that nothing suggestive was mentioned, and our conversation at that point was about his new dog. I blocked him once, but he attempted to follow my social media accounts, and now I've started to see him in my area. Even though the last I knew, he lived nearly 30 to 45 minutes in the opposite direction from me. Am I overreacting, or should I genuinely consider that he's stalking me? I'm a fan from the Republic of Ireland, and I have a story submission for you. I feel like I should tell you early on that this isn't a conventional scary story, not by any stretch of the imagination, but I also can safely say that it was the most terrifying experience of my entire life. It was slow and drawn out, like some extended waking nightmare, but it doesn't involve a midnight encounter with an axe-wielding maniac or visitations from some angry, restless banshee. Instead, the threat that me and my young family faced was just as intangible as the latter, and if you ask me, potentially just as deadly as the former. In 2019, my long-term girlfriend and I welcomed our first child into the world. Conceiving had been difficult as our first pregnancy had resulted in a miscarriage, and it took a while before we were ready to start trying again. But finally... After a long and nerve-wracking process, we had our first baby girl. Obviously, being a new parent is a tough job, but we each relished the challenge, and for two years, everything was just grand. But then came the night when I got a phone call at work, and that call marked the beginning of the darkest, most debilitatingly horrifying period of my entire life. I used to work a lot of long night shifts, still do actually, so four nights a week I'd be off working 12-hour shifts while my girlfriend was at home with our daughter. My work's phone policy was fairly lax, as we were all trusted to set our own pace so long as we got to hit our quotas. So when I got the call from my girlfriend, I told the lads that I was nipping off to take it, and then off I went. As it turns out, our daughter had been feeling a bit poorly and had been up crying well after bedtime complaining of a tummy ache. My girlfriend said that she was a bit worried, so just to be safe, she was going to take the baby to accident and emergency to get her checked over. Obviously, I was worried, but since my girlfriend was sorting it all out, I just got back to work and tried to keep my mind on the job. Over the next few hours, my girlfriend kept texting me updates regarding how things were progressing. At first... Things seemed to be going okay. She got to the hospital, waited her turn, and then a nurse gave our daughter a checkup. I'm obviously hoping for the best, that maybe the nurse will just assign some antibiotics and then send my girlfriend and our daughter away again. But then, one hour after my girlfriend said our daughter was seen by their staff, she sends me an update saying the checkup is still going on and the nurse seemed to be acting a bit strange with her. I asked what she meant by that and she replied saying that when she'd asked them for updates on what they were doing, the nurse had told her, Oh, everything's grand, just be patient and we'll be with you shortly. And more and more time goes by, and our daughter is still off in a cubicle with the nurses. My girlfriend is allowed to sit with her, but is asked to wait where she is while the nurse went off to talk to a doctor. 
Basically, we worked out that something wasn't quite right, and then the last thing I heard from my girlfriend was that some people had asked to talk with her in a private room. After that, everything went quiet for about an hour. Now, by the time my girlfriend stopped texting me back, I'm quite obviously getting very worried. The ideal situation was a quick in-and-out visit, so being taken into a private room for a chat with doctors and nurses gives me the distinct impression that there was some very bad news on the way. And I was right. The next time I heard from my girlfriend, it was another call. The first time she called me that night, she sounded fairly worried, but that second time she sounded distraught. She told me that our daughter had a broken rib, which at first was actually a massive relief. Ribs heal, whereas I'd been worried that she'd been diagnosed with some sort of terminal illness. I'd assumed my girlfriend was crying because she had been through a stressful situation, and she was, but it wasn't because of the broken rib. She was crying because she'd been visited by someone from social services. As soon as she said those two words, social services, the hair on the back of my neck stood on end. Obviously, I had no idea what they wanted at that stage, but I knew that if my girlfriend was crying over it, that it couldn't have been good. And it wasn't. Essentially, we were told that we were under suspicion of either accidentally or purposefully harming our two-year-old daughter, and then in light of that, a case would be opened up against us. I then asked if this social worker had taken our daughter away, or if there were police on their way to arrest us or anything like that. But then amazingly, my girlfriend said no. Social services seemed happy enough to accuse us of breaking our kid's rib, and then let us take her home with us again, which made no sense to me whatsoever at the time and still doesn't. As I said earlier, I was in work when this was going on, and by the time I got the news that we were under investigation, I was in no fit state to be working, so I clocked off and drove to the hospital to pick up my girlfriend. We were in a total state of shock, and this is about three in the morning, so it was such a bombshell that neither of us slept once we got back home. We just stayed up, talking it over, until we got the phone call from the social services lady we dealt with throughout the whole rest of the ordeal. Later on that day, some people would come by to take our daughter away from us. She'd be put in foster care while the investigation continued and we were assured that she'd be perfectly well looked after, but we were also told that if we tried to interfere, we'd be arrested. We told her we understood, and then we ended the call and just cried in each other's arms while our daughter was asleep upstairs. It was the worst accusation imaginable. All we'd ever done was try to give our daughter the best life possible, and we were being accused of doing something that might have killed her, either because we were stupid, neglectful, or evil. We were so confused, too, because a baby's ribs are fairly flexible. They don't break easily, from what we read, meaning a great deal of force had to have been applied in order to cause that kind of fracture. This had us thinking that it hadn't been an accident. We hadn't dropped our daughter, and we definitely hadn't hit her, so who had? And when? And that's the point when we were visited by these massive waves of paranoia. Even though we were basically considered suspects, we still had a right to know all of our child's medical info so we were able to find that out. At the time she was examined, our daughter had been suffering from a broken rib for around two weeks. This meant that it wasn't just me and my girlfriend that were considered suspects. It was everyone who'd been around during the days surrounding this one particular date, and that group included our parents, some of our friends, and all kinds of people. And from the perspective of my girlfriend, I, and social services, was that one of us was to blame, and they'd assumed so until they could prove otherwise. During that time, I barely ate, I barely slept, and I had to take a load of time off of work due to the stress of the whole thing. My faith and trust in almost everything and everyone was completely destroyed, and it all came to a head during a supervised visit that I had with my daughter. Three people were allowed on a supervised visit, which usually ended up being me, my girlfriend, and my mom whenever she could make it. But then this one time, my girlfriend's mom insisted on being the third person, and it almost ended in disaster. We'd all taken the investigation badly, but my girlfriend's mom took it worse than most. She was a pain in the butt before it started, but ramped it up to 11 once our daughter was taken away. I didn't think her joining us was a good idea, and told my girlfriend as much before we left. 
But as I said, my girlfriend's mom insisted, meaning my girlfriend had no other choice unless we wanted to start an argument. The visits tended to be quite casual, and we were always so happy to see our daughter that it was always great vibes in the observation room and the tears once we were out again. We play with her, discuss how she was doing with a social worker, and generally just try to make the most of the visit that always remained supervised. But then, when my mother-in-law was there, the atmosphere was distinctly different. She wouldn't let me touch my daughter, which, fair enough, she hadn't seen her in a while. But then, as she was cradling her, she started asking some very inappropriate questions. She started asking us who we thought had hurt the baby. We'd been warned by everyone, being social services, the police, and our solicitors, never to talk about the case or anything related to it during the supervised visits. But out of the blue, she asked us who we thought the guilty party was. I started giving her a look as if to say, shut your mouth, but she persisted and started speculating on who it might have been. She said she believed that since a woman would be incapable of doing such an awful thing to such a tiny baby, the guilty one had to be a man. Then, while looking me dead in the eyes, she says, in these situations, it's usually the father. I didn't know what to do with myself. I just stood up, walked out of the observation room, then started pacing around my car outside in an attempt to regain my composure. I don't think I've ever been so furious in my entire life, and looking back on it, it's nothing short of a miracle that I managed to keep my cool and remove myself from the situation instead of reacting to it. After all, that's clearly what she wanted. She'd either gotten it into her head that I was to blame and wanted to make sure social services knew it, or she saw the whole thing as an opportunity to make sure that I never saw my daughter again. She never liked me from the moment I met her, so it didn't surprise me that she'd think the worst of me. But to pull a stunt like that at a supervised visit was just another level of scummy, so bad that my ex had actually took my side over it and had quite a large falling out with her mum after the visit. She was never allowed back, which was a huge relief, but to this day, I wouldn't urinate on her if she was on fire. The ordeal continues for a few months to the point that I'd almost completely resigned myself to the idea of never seeing my daughter until she reached 18 and possibly even spending some time in prison. But then one day, almost completely out of the blue, I got a phone call from the same social worker that we'd been dealing with for months. She said that she'd been in touch with a specialist orthopedic surgeon who'd concluded that our daughter had an undiagnosed bone condition. This bone condition was extremely rare and would resolve itself over time with the right diet and vitamin supplements, but it would also explain why an otherwise spongy rib bone would be brittle enough to snap under the kind of sustained pressure that would leave any other baby unharmed. I knew what this meant for us, but I asked her just to be sure and she confirmed it. They were dropping the case against us and we were free to come and pick up our daughter immediately. It was all over, just like that, and honestly, it took a while to hit me. I called my ex, told her everything, then I drove over to her place to pick her up. We drove all the way over to the foster place where our daughter was, where in all fairness the social workers were extremely sorry for causing us so much distress. They gave us the same speech that they'd given us a thousand times, that they never assumed any guilt, and that safe is always better than sorry. But I was barely listening. All I was focused on was getting my daughter back home where she belonged. We had what amounted to an exit interview with a social worker only by telephone, but it was a surprisingly nice way to round the whole thing off. She once again explained why they'd done what they'd done, and then actually took the time to apologize, not just for causing us all that worry and stress, but for our daughter's medical condition, which had obviously been completely unforeseen. I thanked her, forgave her, then that was the last time we spoke. My girlfriend and I are still together, and we're actually planning on having another child, but for a while there, it seemed like the stress of the investigation would be the death of our relationship. I'm proud we survived the ordeal. It was tough, but we made it. And now that I think that, if we can survive something like that... My little family can survive just about anything that gets thrown at us. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. 
I release new videos every Monday and Thursday at 7 p.m. EST, and super fun live streams every Sunday and Wednesday nights, the nights before uploads. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, chat spam ain't edible.